Thanks a lot, Dave. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I took off the subtitle because I, I thought perhaps it was insufficiently serious for the occasion. Um, but in any case, um, I did find that the Brain Mapping Initiative and the Human Brain Project really are a sort of wonderful occasion for reflecting on kind of where things are in neuroscience. And, and also reflecting on the kinds of marvelous discoveries that have been made over the last decade or two, and also the really deep puzzles that remain um, of a very, very deep kind, I think, um, in neuroscience. Puzzles that we may eventually be able to solve by coming at them in sort of funny, indirect ways, or maybe even uh, approaching them directly. Puzzles such as the one that I mentioned at the, in the discussion period, and that was how do neurons code information, and also why is there so much spontaneous activity, what's going on in that. In any case, uh, what I want to do today is to say a little bit about uh, human brains and, and the usefulness of clinical subjects when it's possible in providing that very special uh, set of data that complement what we get from animal studies. Now, this is, um, compared to the slide that Sean showed, this is really a little bit pitiful. Um, but it was, this, it, it, it was meant to, it was designed by me and Terry Sanofsky many years ago, 1992, for an article in Science. And really what we wanted to convey in a very loose way is that there are many levels of organization in nervous systems. And of course, we don't know how many, and I think it's true to say that we still do not really know how many there are, and that almost certainly networks should divide into macro and micro and so forth. But that nevertheless, it's very clear that there are many levels of organization and that you might think of Mars' three questions as being askable at any one of those levels. That is, what is the job of stuff at this level? How does it do it? And what are the, the subcomponents of the structure that does that job? And um, we should, of course, embellish this figure by including a cultural environment and also including genes, but there's something useful about having just a very, very simple figure. And our idea at the time was really that in the long haul there should be a kind of explanatory linkage between the levels. That it was unlikely that, for example, you would explain properties of behavior perception or speech or reaching in terms of the properties of individual synapses with nothing in between. That likely there would be a kind of stepwise set of explanations linking one level um, to another. And it was important for us to point that out because at that time there were philosophers who thought that it was just hilarious to suppose that you might explain high level uh, mental functions in terms of the properties of the brain. And so sometimes they would straw man us by saying, ha oh, oh, isn't it just too hilarious to think that you might be able to explain, say, consciousness or decision making in terms of an individual neuron. And uh, so we wanted to indicate that, of course, uh, that was not likely to be the way things were gonna go. So our general conception was that there should be a fit in some manner or other, uh, between the varieties of level, a kind of explanatory fit. And that for, for in the meanwhile, as it were, we could approach the nature of that fit in a fairly loose way. In other words, you don't have to get terribly excited about explaining what a reductive explanation is. You can just kind of put that to the side for the moment because in general, people understand quite well when you do have a fit uh, and when you don't. <coughs> Nevertheless, um, it's also, I think, useful to point out that 
explanations or understand, perhaps I should put it that way, that what it is to understand is itself a property of the brain. That's something that brains do. And that, moreover, um, there isn't a precise definition of what it is to understand the phenomenon or what it is to get a good explanation. By and large, uh, in the sciences, we learn what constitutes a good explanation by hanging around in the lab for a while, getting bashed about when we think something's a good explanation and the PI says, no, 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 this is why not. And of course, in the ordinary um, aspects of ordinary life, we understand more or less what constitutes a good explanation and what does not. Uh, our car repair person, for example, uh, will smarten us up if we offer an explanation for why the car doesn't work in terms of ghosts. Now, in this context, and also because I was making the assumption, perhaps false, that there would be philosophy graduate students here, uh, I also wanted just to make um, an observation, again, of a very loose sort. I don't want to uh, give this too much precision. But an observation about the nature of categories and concepts. That is, let's just start with the everyday things like river or house or friend or understand and so forth. And in the 1970s, the psychologist Eleanor, Eleanor Roche made an observation, which is that most of our workaday categories, and by workaday I, I want to contrast them to the very precise definitions for categories that we have in the special sciences. Most of our workaday categories have a radial structure, by which she meant that they have sort of prototype examples that we all agree upon, that you can think of as being at the center of the category, and on the outside are very fuzzy boundaries, and in between is sort of declining levels of similarity to prototypes. And so, for example, the famous example has to do with vegetable. Um, so if, if uh, you ask an undergraduate class what's the first vegetable that comes to their mind and they're in California, uh, they're going to say carrot. If you ask them a lot about radishes, are they vegetables? Well, radishes turn out not to be prototypical vegetables. Some people do not consider them vegetables at all. They sort of stick them out here. Uh, some people do, and, but it's very clear that they aren't prototypical vegetables. And then perhaps even further out in the fuzzy boundaries are things like wild mushroom. I show some chanterelles here. Or the example that uh, Eleanor Ross used was parsley. And so uh, there really is no right answer to the question, is parsley really a vegetable? Oh, no. no. I mean, nobody really cares. I <laughs> now, the problem with a certain amount of philosophy, and this had to do with expressions like is conscious, knows, believes, desires, intends, and needs, is that philosophers, instead of recognizing that these were radial concepts, fought about those concepts in a way that you and I might fight about whether parsley is a vegetable. And so a lot of philosophy in the last century turned out to be analogous to fighting over whether or not parsley is a vegetable. Now, I just want to make one other point in, in this regard. Now, remember, this really is partly because I'm interested in the notion of understanding and explanation, and I'm not going to give you a precise definition because there isn't a suitable one. But I think the notion of a house is also one that we think of as fishing the description that Eleanor Roche gave, except that it's quite interesting that what counts as a prototype varies as a function of culture. And so you might think that in Texas, that's a prototypical house. In Inuvik, that is. Uh, somewhere on the prairies in the 1920s, that was, and so on and so forth. And this is also analogous to certain kinds of categories. And so you will see cultural variation, for example, with regard to what com constitutes being truthful or honorable or a friend and so forth. And those two, even though you might think those are, are 
moral concepts, they too have this radial structure of prototypes, fuzzy boundaries where there is no right answer and everything else in between. Um, now, it, the title of the talk reflects the fact that I think that one of the very striking things about neuroscience over the last two or three decades is that when we think about those levels that I characterized at the beginning, we can see many places where there are linkages, where there are sort of explanatory hands held across the divide. You might not want to say we have the whole explanation or that we completely understand, but that there are ropes across the divide is very clear. And in the list, I want to include such things as addiction, sleep, which we understand at many levels uh, in much greater detail than we did, say, 20 or 30 years ago, of course. We can see a certain pattern uh, in the EEG, but also by doing single cell recordings, either uh, in the cell or uh, in the neural pill, you can see very specific events. We also know very specific events that happen at the level of neurotransmitters. And so we don't yet have anything that constitutes a really complete explanation of sleep. So we don't exactly understand why we lose consciousness, although there are good hypotheses about that. Um, but we do understand much more uh, than we used to. Decision making seems to me to be another topic where even 15 years ago, many people would have thought that it was definitely off limits to neuroscience. And yet we know now that even in the case of rodents, we can see very interesting questions. For example, questions about the integration of sensory information from vision and the auditory system, how that integration happens. And because rodent brains are, at least in terms of their, all their structural bits, are the same as our brains, it's a very, very useful and fertile uh, place to start. Self-control is another instance where we have learned some <coughs> non-trivial things about the nature of the pathways, about the nature of uh, the relationships between cortical and, very importantly, subcortical structures. Trevor Robbins in his lab, on the assumption that self-control involves the capacity to defer gratification, to cancel an action once started, to pay attention even though there are distractions and to suppress impulses, has shown really significant capacities for self-control in rats. Not in all rats, interestingly. Some of them are not very really good at deferring gratification, and others are really very good at it. Um, and interestingly, when it comes to action cancellation, you start an action, you're a rat, you hear the sound, you stop. And the sound can happen any time between when you're put into the setup and when you're just about to make the nose poke. And um, some rats are good at it and some aren't. And an interesting question is this. Do those capacities entirely overlap? Are the same guys good at the same things? The answer is no, they're not. There is some overlap, but some guys can do action cancellation, but they're lousy at deferring gratification. Very interesting. So then they chart what the underlying circuitry looks like. And it turns out it looks like somewhat different, but overlapping circuitry uh, is involved. And finally, my sort of uh, uh, passion du jour is sociality, uh, social neuroscience, um, and <coughs> And I'm just going to quickly zoom past this. but. This, of course, is a rat brain. Um, this is a diagram I got from George Koo, who works on addiction and has made many, many important discoveries about the nature, the underlying nature of addiction and how it affects subcortical structures and exactly the nature of the underlying distribution of receptors for things like the opioids, the cannabinoids, nicotine, and what the nature of addiction at the behavioral level in these rats looks like, and whether that sort of behavior in rats looks anything like addictive behavior in humans. And of course it does. <laughs>
They really like alcohol. They tend to like it around 4 30, 5 o'clock. <laughs> 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 yes, they're all thinking that. Okay. Now, as I said at the outset, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, the human brain and the importance of studying uh, the human brain. Now, clearly, and we all understand this, that animal studies are absolutely indispensable and essential. But occasionally, of course, it's possible to get human data where what you're doing is recording or stimulating from very particular regions of the cortex in the clinical context. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, and I'll show you a video in a moment, is some uh, work that's been done by a group at uh, Stanford and in the Department of Neurology. There is a new paper coming out in Neuron in a couple of weeks. First author is Joseph Parvizzi. So in, in um, these studies, these are patients with refractory epilepsy. And as preparation for surgery to deal with the epilepsy, there are explorations using intracranial electrodes to determine what areas are sensitive and will cause a seizure, what areas are independent, and so forth. And you can use that occasion, of course, to get additional information that's relevant to science in general, but, but which may also have clinical implications uh, for other patients. Now, it's unusual to get two patients who have to have electrodes in exactly the same place, but uh, in the two cases I'm going to talk to you about, that is what happened. In these two patients, there were depth electrodes that were put into the cingulate cortex. More precisely, they were put into the mid-region of the anterior cingulate in both patients. And that was as a function of where they uh, feared that the uh, epileptic trigger zone was. It turned out that it was not there, but it was important to find out what exactly was there. So patient A is here, patient B is there, and you can see in the different sections, sagittal section, coronal section, uh, sorry, horizontal section, coronal section, sagittal, you can see where the midline, uh, the mid anterior cingulate region is where these depth electrodes were put. And they're essentially the same position uh, for both subjects. So uh, the next step was to stimulate with milliamps, so it's a very mild stimulation, and to see what the effect would be. Would a seizure be caused or would something else be caused? Now, what I want to show you now is a video. Permission was granted by the patient to use this video, and you can, I think, also go on to YouTube if you wish to see it again. Um, there will be, uh, in what you're going to see, you will see only one of the patients. He's the more voluble and expressive of the two, but the other one says much the same thing. And what you're going to see is that when this particular region is stimulated, you might think that when it's stimulated, you're going to get a fairly simple response, right? They're going to feel pain, or they're going to feel anxiety, or they're going to feel like a sneeze. It's not anything like that. It's very interesting. And so, uh, now we will go. Yeah, my upper respiratory started kind of my chest and respiratory system trying to get kind of shaky. Like it was wanting to um go and push itself out the breathing. Okay. Okay. Did you feel any change in your emotion and mood? <coughs> yeah, not my emotion, but in my mood, I kind of get the feeling like um, I was starting into a storm. That's the kind of feeling I got. It was almost like you're headed towards this storm that's on the other side of you, a couple of miles away, and you can get across the hill. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there going, how am I going to figure out how to get over that, through that? And that's the way my brain started. 
Did it happen? And it was just about the same way of last time. And my chest ever since there starts pounding like it's, you know, like you're a football player getting ready to go out and make, try to make his first touchdown for the season or something. <laughs> it's not that type of thing. It's more like this thing of trying to figure out your way out of how you can get through something. It's not a matter of how you're going to production wise. Right? Well, can you tell me a little bit more? Going through something, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean? Going Let's say uh, if you knew you were driving your car and it was the only car was half flat and you're only halfway there and you have no other way to turn around and go back, you gotta keep going forward. That type of a you know feeling you have to like you like might be might be Get through this through. Was it negative or positive? It was, it was more of a positive type thing of uh, push harder, push harder, push harder to try to get through this. And that's when my heart started. I, I, I don't know if you were reading my heart rate or anything. Your heart rate, was it starting to go up at that time? Or? Okay, let's, let's try one more time if you don't mind. Is this unpleasant? I don't find it unpleasant. You don't find it unpleasant? No. Okay. Uh, do you think this time when I did it, was it stronger or the same? The same. The same. How about now? One, two, three. What happened? Nothing. You didn't see it. Absolutely not. to kind of deal with this impending catastrophe. And interestingly, it was essentially the same constellation or bundle, sort of cognitive, motivational, emotional bundle, uh, that the second patient had also. So there's several things about this uh, that really interest me. One, for anybody who still is under the, the oh heck I'll say it, under the illusion uh, that the brain is not producing consciousness. It's pretty interesting that just by turning on a few milliamps, you can generate this effect, and then turning it off, it ceases. And you can see from the sham example, and of course they ran lots of sham tests as well, uh, that you never got the effect in the sham test. They ran, um, they, they did the probe six times for each patient. And every time, the description was essentially the same. So I kind of think that these guys, with their cogent, clear, articulate reports, were describing the conscious sensation. So that was one thing. The other thing is that there has been a tendency to think that if you have the experience of willing, I actually never have myself, but, but I'm told, no, 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 seriously, I look into myself, and I think, I'll pick that up. What did that feel like? It didn't happen. I don't have an experience of making a decision or willing. I do have an experience afterwards of thinking, oh, I made that decision. But anyway. Philosophers sometimes say that there is an experience of willing, and whenever you have that experience, it constitutes evidence for the existence of a non-physical will that operates independently of physical causes. Well, it's pretty interesting that this guy, these guys, uh, have that sensation, but we know that it's cause. And uh, in almost, one can be able virtually certain that in the normal course of making decisions and mustering the courage to deal with an impending catastrophe, um, that causes of one kind or another are involved. I mean, it's not the case that they felt as though they were puppets. And interestingly enough, addicts, who are clearly caused in some rather abnormal way to do what they do, uh, do not feel like puppets either. Smokers who go for just one more cigarette will tell you that their experience of doing that 
is no different from their experience of picking up a toothpick. Yeah, it's much the same. They don't have a different inner experience. So I think it's very tempting to think that it's plausible. This is not a, what you might call a philosophical demonstration, whatever that is. But I think it's very tempting to think it's plausible that you would have uh, causes even in the normal case. Yes, I know. Four minutes and 15 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so the next thing I want to show you is the thing that they uh, did next in the Provinci lab. So what they wanted to do was to raise the question about modularity. And since this has come up in earlier talks, I'm rather pleased that, that this question can also be raised here. So in order to ask the question about modularity, they first of all thought, well, is it plausible to suppose that there is a module in the sense that that particular clump of neurons is sufficient for an effect? Is that plausible? And they thought it was not, probably based largely on independent evidence for widely distributed networks. But what they did then was to put each patient in the scanner and to see them as a region of interest, the mid area of the anterior cingulum. And then, of course, what they watched for were bowl fluctuations over the entire brain. And that's what you're seeing in panel A and panel B, of course, different sections. And what they found was that there are indeed, and they were similar between patients, areas that were connected to the region of interest in the anterior cingulate, namely the frontal insula and the frontal polar regions in particular. And this actually coheres with earlier data from Seeley and others showing that there is a kind of emotional salience network, and that's what uh, these are the Seeley data uh, shown on the bottom. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of unlikely in this case, that the mid-region of the anterior cingulate is in and of itself a module in the sense, and maybe this is a strong man too, in the sense that it is sufficient to produce the feeling of foreboding and the mustering of gumption uh, feeling. I think it probably does have much to do with subcortical structures, including the striatum and the accumbens. It probably does have to do with the anterior insula and the frontal polar regions. So if that's so, then I don't quite know how to parse the idea of modularity, except in the sense that we can see specificity, but specificity doesn't entail sufficiency of that structure. Okay. Now I'm going to end, you'll be happy to know, because I've got 211 left, with a very practical point about human anatomy, human brain anatomy. When the Damasios were in Iowa, I visited them the lab many times, and one of the things that was very impressive was that in Iowa there is a culture of donating post-mortem post -mortem brains, and people typically, normally, standardly do it. So the other day when I was at Cold Spring Harbor, I talked to Kathy Rockland, who is an anatomist, and here's an interesting fact. It's very difficult to get human brains on which to do the detailed human anatomy. There are, for example, some uh, um, Alzheimer's brains, some Parkinsonian brains, but if you don't have control brains to check against what you're seeing, how do you know whether what you're looking at in this particular region is or is not abnormal? Interestingly enough, there are very, very few, almost none, that Kathy could get a hold of, of autistic brains. And I think a really, I know this is not as exciting as multi-million dollar ohms and bones and things like that, but it is, I think, extremely important to have human neuroanatomy and have it done well, and anything we can do to change that culture would be important. In my last 40 seconds, I want to make one quick comment that Rafa and I talked about at the break, and that is, I am on an ethics panel for DARPA. And DARPA wants us, and it involves Mike Kazaniga, Steve Hyman, myself, 
uh, James Giordano, someone from the Army, and someone from the VA. And they are giving us really free reign to look at every program, to talk to any PI, to visit any military installation, and uh, to really survey in as close a way as we would like the ethical implications of any program that comes before DARPA. And uh, I actually feel tremendously honored to be involved. And I will have to say also, because you know I'm a comedian, and what do I know about the military? I mean, I think we have a ship, but I'm not sure. <laughs> But I think it's a tremendous opportunity for something that has been lacking since the draft was abandoned. And that is a sort of everyday understanding of many of us who are not in the military of what actually goes on, of the kinds of problems they confront, of the nature of the brain difficulties that are suffered by soldiers coming home. And of course, that's a major part of the interest of DARPA, is in targeting therapies uh, for individuals with brain damage. So Dave says it's now 0, 0.0. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. <laughs>